Hey, this is Doc G, and today we're going to earn and invest in recognizing our self-worth with Dani Fatizi as she recounts her harrowing escape from bartending. I hadn't thought much about Lonnie until recently. In fact, I hadn't thought about him at all until the other day I was perusing the newspaper and I saw his name in the obituaries. In his early 60s, he died of COVID-19. And I was filled with a rush of memories. You see, Lonnie was the cook at the restaurant I worked at in high school. And looking back, he was probably an alcoholic, although I didn't realize it at that time. But he was the guy who would buy alcohol for us. And we'd buy a case and give him a six pack and take him home. And then we would, you know, hang out and party the rest of the night with the alcohol he bought us. And he had been there for years before my few years tenure that I spent there during high school and had continued to work there until just a week or two ago when he died. He was a lifer. And when I went to college... I saw a lot more young people get involved in the service industry. And it was a little bit more, you know, Anthony Bourdain kitchen confidential, right? When I was a kid, I I worked in a family restaurant. But in college, people went to work at glitzy bars and expensive restaurants. And some got knocked around, beat up, and spit out by the system. But others stayed. And I mostly never heard from those people ever again. Danny Fatizi is a woman who wears many hats. She is a real estate investor, world traveler, course creator, and of most importance for our discussion today, a former bartender and server. Danny, it's nice to meet you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to talk to you about something that I feel deeply about because I was involved in the service industry and so many people are when they are young. And at first it feels very glamorous, but in some ways I also think there is a dark side, which is something we're going to talk about a little bit later. But first of all, talk to me a little bit about growing up. How were you as a kid? Did you develop a healthy sense of self-esteem? What was it like being a kid in your family? So, oh, yeah, that's a loaded one. But (laughs) do I love and adore my parents? Yes, they're super awesome support system to this day. But growing up, I I lived in a household where my mom was home all the time. And my father actually worked on Wall Street and he was gone. So I never really got to see him. In the mornings when I woke up, he was already on his way to work. And when we were going to bed, he was not even home yet. So I really didn't have an active dad in the early stages of my life, even though he adored us and loved us so much. So we, we relied on our mom, my brother and I, I keep saying we relied on my mom for quite a bit of our, you know, self-esteem and, and like understanding how to grow into a, you know, a kid and an adult and on and on. And I think my mom was going through some things then, and she wasn't really able to give us that, guidance at all. Like we really were not guided whatsoever to have boundaries and self-esteem, self-awareness, self-respect. Those things were all missing. So as I continued to go into grade school and then, you know, middle school, and I, I really didn't have a foundation that allowed me to stand up for myself or see myself in a light that other people kind of couldn't shake, if that makes sense. It sounds like you identified with your mom more than your dad. I would agree at that age. Yes. And that's maybe changed as you've gotten older. It has. And now I really do identify more with my father. I would say physically, I'm a carbon copy of my mom, but mentally, logically, emotionally, I'm more of my father now. Because as I grow up and and he was able to be around us more when we moved away from that area. And he was able to have a more, you know, regular hours sort of job. And we got older, he and I got to spend a lot more time together and realized how similar we actually were, you know? So those early years, your formation of self-esteem and feelings of self-worth were reflected more in your mother's behavior. As you grew older and went to high school, were you a good student? I was a 
Yeah, I was an okay <laughs> student. I was an okay student. I was definitely like a B average type of student. I wasn't killing myself to like show off and be that overachiever. I was an overachiever in a lot of other ways. Um, I was an extracurricular overachiever. I wanted to be involved in everything with everyone and give those things all of my effort and attention. I really wasn't much for the academics. Like I wasn't, ugh. if I didn't understand a subject, I would avoid it rather than trying to work through it. All that being said, though, you were college bound and had plans mm-hmm. for higher education. I did and never wavered in that. I always knew the plan was for me to go to college. My parents had been putting money away for me to go to college for most of my life. So it never even was a question in my mind that I was going, whether that be, you know, to a university or it didn't matter where, but I was definitely going. So junior year of high school, I applied, I applied to one school where my friends, most of my friends were going. And it was something that I knew would be a sure thing for the most part. I did have a little like, Oh, well, what if I don't get in? But I pretty much knew Based on the size of the school, my other, you know, my friends' GPAs and things like of that nature that I was probably going to get into this school. So it was an easy just, I just pressed the easy button on that one. Looking back, I really don't, I wish I had gone and done, done it differently. I do. And when you got to college, you studied hospitality. What's the difference between hospitality and service? Oh, oh gosh. So hospitality can cover so much. I would say hospitality is everything from when I started there, I was planning on getting into wedding planning, right? So hospitality management, there was everything from food and beverage industry to hotels and human resources to, you know, wedding planning, which is really what I had gone to do. And then service industry, I would say, Yes, there are so many service-based industries now, but when we refer to the service industry, what we're referring to is food and beverage. That's really the classification for service industry. So that's the difference. This is more dialed in. I feel like almost we're talking about, I don't know if you've ever watched Downton Abbey, but they're, you know, they're, they talk about the, the people who worked for the rich English families. They were into service, right? They were the butlers Mm -hmm. and the cooks, et cetera. Maybe the term actually comes from, you know, 18th century England. But yeah, basically we're talking about the service industry, food and beverage, bartending, waitressing, Mm -hmm. waitering, et cetera. You studied service and you, you even mentioned in one of your videos that when you first started your classes, one of your teachers asked, so how many people want to be wedding planners? And everyone raised their hand. Why did you not end up doing that? Like, why didn't you go in that direction? You know, that was sort of a multifaceted situation. I actually had had some, shortly after going to school to plan weddings, I had gotten the opportunity to plan a few weddings. And it was, I'm, I'm a multitasker. And I'm the kind of person that like, if you give me a list I'm a type A. I'm going to cross it out. And every time I cross something out, I'm going to love that feeling, right? So I was able to knock out these weddings with, you know, I was capable of that. But I did not fall in love with the process. I was kind of overwhelmed by that process. So over time, and actually, you know, in the beginning of those hospitality courses, you're really just studying marketing, advertising, human resources, and like the basics. We weren't even getting into those courses yet that I really was excited about. And my love for it, because I was actually able to do some hands-on weddings, kind of fell away before I even made it to those courses. Did you end up going towards service then as a default when you found that you were no longer interested in wedding planning and hospitality? I did. And it wasn't because in my head, it made sense that that's what I wanted to be doing as a career long term yet. It was more just a lucrative way to pay the bills because now I was out of the house. My parents weren't footing the bills anymore and student loans were going to come due at some point. And I just thought, okay, what's something I can get into? I had hostess as a child. And by a child, I say 14 years old, my mm-hmm. very first job, right? I'm like a kid. And that was the only job I could do at the time. Couldn't handle alcohol. So I hostess and I knew what the servers and bartenders were making. So I thought, you know what? Like they don't have college degrees. I haven't graduated yet. And then 
an opportunity came up where my brother actually was able to get me into one of our local bars here to bartend. An opening happened and he had been going there for a long time drinking espressos during the day. We like to say that he drank espressos during the day, but I think they were serving (laughs) him underage. But he pretty much stuck my name in there when they had that opening. And they said, yeah, send her in. Let's see how she does, right? So I get in there and I had no clue, no sense of even what it was to be behind the bar. I didn't, and this was beer and wine only. I wasn't even doing liquor. So just learning how to open a bottle of wine was an experience, you know? So yeah, it's not that I, I planned myself to be in that career. It's just more, it was, it was attractiveness to the, you know, the money that could be made. Let's talk about that attractiveness a little more. Is there something besides the money? I mean, you're talking about the fact that obviously it wasn't easy to get a job at this bar. You happen to slip in with an opening. Is there some glamour there? with that type of job that pulls people in? I would, I would venture to say it depends. I think situational. For the, for the people who are working in like chain restaurants, I wouldn't say that that for sure has like an allure. Maybe the bartending part of it has an allure because bartenders do have this like old school, you know, attr- it's an attractiveness to that. If you're going to be in a restaurant, the bartender is probably – that's the most glamorized position, I think, in any restaurant or bar. But then, you know, for me, I guess, yes, to answer your question, yes, because the bar that I ended up at was a cigar bar and a jazz room. And it had that, like, I'm an old soul. And it just, it made so much sense. And then when I was there, it actually was quite what I wanted it to be, the 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 jazz and and the cigars. And it had that romance to it that I was like, felt very special to be a part of. I feel like we see that in the movies all the time too, right? Like the bartender is kind of hip or even the waiter or waitress, like they can be glamorized Mm -hmm. in media. Tell me a little bit how this felt to you specifically. I mean, you talked a little bit about your childhood and the lack of self-worth. Did this job play into that a little bit? It definitely played into it. I think this was a huge turning point for me because up until that part of my life, and I guess I was 21 or 22 coming into this bartending job, this first bartending job, I had really struggled with self-image. And I didn't even realize. I think when you're in the tree, like in the forest, you can't see the trees, right? So I was really struggling with self-image, got into this bar and started getting compliments, right? Even if they were coming from like a place that maybe it wasn't the greatest place or the most straightforward or, you know, it was this uh, feeling I'd never really had before where people were kind of coming to me, looking to me as an authority, even in this minor jurisdiction of the bar, you know, and, and expecting me to have the gossip, expecting me to have, you know, people have told me things that they want to know or, you know, complimenting me on my hair or whatever it may be, my outfit or how, and I got into this character of working in this dark smoky jazz bar where I had, you know, cut my hair off and dyed it black and I was dressing in dark colors and I was very angsty and, very punk rock, if you will. And I got into this role and people loved this role on me, you know, and I identified with that. But then I think, and I may be getting ahead of myself here or us, but I think now looking back, like I realized I was just playing roles in each of these jobs that I had. I fit a role that wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was me finding a way to make it okay or finding a way to build up my self-esteem a little bit more, even if it wasn't necessarily what I needed at the time, a true form of self-esteem. I don't think that's what it was, if that makes sense. Looking back, do you think the industry preys on young people with those type of issues, that archetype of person who needs some of that sense of belonging and maybe utilizes that to get more out of their employees? I do. Not to call out any particular restaurants, but you know, there are those restaurants that specialize in like beautiful women as the servers and bartenders only. And you have to have certain physical assets to work there. And it's, I think, 
a lot of women, I would say like I've experienced this myself. So I'm speaking about it from a place of not pointing fingers, but having literally done this myself, I have done that role. I've done that role of like play sexy to get a better, you know, leg up in the industry or to make more money or whatever. And, and it really came from not understanding that I don't have to do that. I'm a smart, adaptable, intelligent woman. And I was growing and learning at the time. So, you know, I definitely didn't know as much as I know now and continue to learn every day. But I think at the time I fell into that role because I, I, we've definitely, I've had, I've had bosses that quite literally pulled the hair, the, the hair tie out of my hair and said, you will wear your hair down in my restaurant and bar. Like you do not like the, you will wear high heels behind the bar because there's a physical aspect to this that can't be denied. And I think, yes, it comes down to younger impressionable people. I think this even happens with men too, because men in a bartending role, that's a very, it can be a very sexy thing. Like it can come across that way. And the money is for sure, you know, braided into that. Like it's a direct result. You know, if you, if you play up that role, you can make more money, period. Yeah. In fact, the money in a sense is almost addictive, right? That's why people get into these jobs and stay in them maybe far past when it's good for them. Absolutely. The money is extremely addictive. It's next level addictive. It's the kind of thing where, and I hear this regularly from friends and I remember it coming out of my own mouth. Oh, well, I just made $500. So I'll definitely come back tomorrow, (laughs) you know, and try to do it again. And maybe you don't do $500 the next day. Maybe you do 250, but you know, in your head what the threshold is now. And every time you make a little bit more and a little bit more, you know what the possibilities are. Oh, I just need the right amount of people and those people to buy the right things. And maybe I need to flirt a little bit more with the right person and I can make $600 tomorrow. It's so real. We talked about that first job you had at the cigar bar and right, you dyed your hair and cut it short and you were talking about being somewhat angsty and it almost sounds kind of cool or glamorous. And I want to contrast that with what you said afterwards, which is you realized that it was not a place where you were going to grow as a person or add your skill set mm-hmm. or even evolve. Do you remember a point where it changed from being one to the other? I do. I remember getting to the point where, I mean, yes, the money was great. The money was great. But then there, there was a turning point where I started to realize it was clear that I didn't have boundaries and that the groups of people that I was working with didn't want me to grow or change or get better or go down a different road. And I was just becoming a punching bag, not just for guests who didn't really understand circumstances that were out of my control that I was apologizing for and apologizing for and never feeling like I was getting an inch with these customers back, you know, and, and taking that so deeply emotionally into account that, you know, something was wrong with me for not being able to deliver on that thing. Even if it was out of my control down to, let's say my bosses who had sometimes completely unreasonable expectations of me asking me to do things that were definitely not part of the job description. But I was at a point where I was so addicted to the money and so unable to see that I could just go out and get a different job or go out and have a different circumstance altogether or say no and just kind of throw it in, you know, stick it against the wall and see what was going to happen. You know, I just said yes to everything. There was no no. No was not in the vocabulary. So that was really, I think, when it was – just time. Like I, I was still in the service indi- industry for quite a bit longer beyond recognizing that, but I knew it was like exit strategy time. Like I had to start coming up with some way to cover expenses and go do something else. In a lot of ways, you were conditioned to not say no. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. I think, I mean, it goes back to even just my upbringing, you know. I didn't really ever learn boundaries. No one taught me boundaries. I think I look at my parents to this day and God love them. I still don't think they 
do very well with their own boundaries with others, with other people, you know, with, with external sources. And so I don't really think I had great examples of how to set boundaries. And then I carried that into friendships that were abusive, relationships with boyfriends that were abusive, that I just kept making excuses for people's bad behavior when I would never behave that way. And when I finally did draw the line in the sand, it was a dramatic thing because people are like, wait, 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 you know, you're the yes girl. Or, you know, wait, where did this come from? I thought we were in love and we were going to ride off into the sunset together, you know? And I'm like, no, this is not going to work for me, you know? And I would draw the line in the sand and I would do it in a very unhealthy way because I I was never taught how to do it in a healthy way. So that's blown up quite a few times in my face. And then going into, you know, taking it back to the work scenario, you know, saying no to a boss, that's a scary thing. That is very scary for a lot of people. Like next level, that's your job security. That's your food on the table. That's your electricity bill paid. I I think that is so scary for a lot of people. And there are so many people like me who have or continue to do things for job security that are absolutely not part of their job description and should never be part of their job description. It sounds like even past job security, that saying no or deciding to move on from a service job was treated as disloyalty, even Mm. from your fellow servers who felt like you were leaving them. I would agree. I think when you all, in certain scenarios, there are people who I would say are gems and they do have, like, they do want you to grow and they do love you like that. But I think for the people who don't have that kind of ability to see beyond their own circumstances and see you trying to improve and want that for you, yes, there's, there's a sort of, tra- like, like, like you're a traitor now. Like you're betraying, we, we've all gone through this together. We've all gone through this together up until this point. We hate this guy or we hate this job together. Where are you going? (laughs) Where are you going? Like, we're supposed to be in this together. We're supposed to drink about it together and eat about over it together and and, and whatever, you know? We're going to just, that was, it, it gets to a point where it's all you talk about. It's all you talk about. It's like the customer story or the the boss story or the kitchen story or the dishwasher story. It's always a story and it's always about work. And it's just, what are we doing? None of this is improving anybody. (laughs) But that's, when you're in it, you're in it, you know? A while back, you used the term punching bag, that in some ways you had become a punching bag. I remember you telling a story about working in New York at a well-known restaurant called Budokan, Mm. and you were working 50 to 60 hours a week. Tell us a little bit about the physical and emotional toll that takes on you. Well, I mean, including working in Manhattan and living in Manhattan that goes along with that job and the financial requirements of living in Manhattan putting the pressure on to show up every day and do those 50 to 60 hours in a gigantic, gigantic restaurant. This used to be the Nabisco factory. So they would pull the trucks. I mean, we're talking Oreo cookies, okay? Like they would pull the trucks in and out of this building. It's huge. I mean, huge. And they decided to turn it into Budokan. And and it's really the Chelsea market. And part of the Chelsea market is this restaurant. And it's up the stairs and it's down the stairs and it's up the stairs and it's running. And the, the restaurant, actually, the, the owner of the company has this strategy that if you put a DJ in the building and you pump this music and you pump it so loud and speed it up, the servers will work faster. Everyone will work faster, which means you can turn the tables faster. What that means for people who don't know the service industry is if you got people on it right now eating, they get out and you put new people on it (laughs) and then they're eating. So the more you can turn the tables, the more money everyone's making, the more sales we're making, the more, you know, so it's turn and burn, turn and burn, turn and burn. So when you get in the door at a job like this, when you know you're going to walk out the door that night with seven, 800, maybe over a thousand dollars and you have a uniform and you, you know, if you show up without all the pieces of your uniform, your lighter, your single serve tray, all your pens, your pay, everything. 
in your little bag that they make you carry, they just send you home. You're not, you're not prepared to work today, so you can go home. Bye. Someone else can make your money. We'll see you next week. So it was like, you have to show up and you better be prepared. Like show up prepared and then service starts and you know, it's just bananas until two in the morning, three in the morning, which is when we would stop serving food at two or three in the morning. And then you sit on a train like a zombie because you're exhausted, mentally, physically, emotionally exhausted because it's just, we looked, we saw 1200 people come through the door and eat and drink and, and a DJ was spinning tracks faster and faster and faster. And it's, that's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. It almost sounds like an episode of Survivor. You describe how, as the night goes on, they send, start sending servers home, probably to yes. save money, which means if you are left over, you are walking further distances, seeing more customers, and hustling more as the night goes on, as you find yourself covering a greater distance. Oh my gosh, is that true? So when you start there, it's a month of just training. You don't even get to serve anybody for the first month. You have to sit, eat food. You have to, you have to shadow every single job in the restaurant. Barista, bar back, bartender, server, food runner, everything. So that when you finally get going and you get on the floor as a server, they put you in this three table section and you do these three tables over and over and over until they know you can nail it. Then they move you up into bigger sections, more intense sections, more people, bigger tables, whatever, better, better areas of the restaurant where people are going to spend more, more VIP, whatever. Okay. So when they see you can handle all these things and I, for some reason, flew through all of these levels, I just did. Because because you're you. Because I'm me and because I'm nuts and because I'm like, I got to prove myself. I've got to prove myself. I've got to prove myself to everyone, right? So I fly through all these levels and I end up closing server in four months at a place where people have been there for 11 years, okay? Now this four-month server, me, is in the closing section, okay? On the best nights of the week sometimes. Sometimes it wasn't, but sometimes it was. And I probably worked five or six nights a week, 60, 70 hours a week. And as a closer, you come in a little later than everyone else, but you leave way later than everyone else, right? So as the tables are, as, as the 1,200 people start to dissipate now, we've probably only got 100 or so people coming in or 200 or so people coming in. They start cutting the servers, the other servers. So they're going home, they're going home, they're going home. They're doing their side work. They're leaving. They're like, bye, bye. You know, everyone's out the door. And the hostess has to continue seating whatever walks in the door or is still reserved. So at 1 a.m., you're still getting tables sitting down. (laughs) Who want to eat? It's crazy. So they would literally come in and, and as the servers are disappearing and you end up with an entire floor of the restaurant to yourself that you have to take all the tables that sit down, they don't always know who's going to walk in the door. So they think, oh, well, she'll probably have eight more tables and then she'll be out of here, which eight more tables is like, okay, eight more tables. If you seat one every, you know, five, 10 minutes, I'm fine. But if 20 tables walk in the door at the same time and you have to literally stagger them every three to five minutes, you're seating a table, seating a table, seating a table. I can't even go fill the water pitchers that fast. Like you have to come to a table and spiel them on how the menu even works because it's not the same as your typical restaurant. You're asking them what kind of water they want. You're asking them, you know, all the different types of things. And it it is kind of like Survivor. I would agree with that. (laughs) Did they at least let you wear flats, I hope? They did. We had to wear very special shoes. And I would say they're the best shoes. I can't remember the name brand now, but they're like the non-slips and they make them in these cute little Mary Janes. So for the girls, you don't have to look like, you know, you're not wearing clogs anymore and they're still non-slip. Thank God, because you need them. Non-slip is important. In the first half of the show, Danny Fatizi talks about how she fell into bartending. After the break, we delve into what being in the service industry taught her about humanity. But first, have you ever decided that maybe index investing was not the only place you wanted to put your money? 
Have you ever thought that between stocks and bonds and maybe a little real estate holdings that you are missing out? I know this is a common feeling out there in the world, and not all of us are basic index and bond investors, especially with the returns that we expect to come over the next decade or two, many are looking for ways to increase the returns on their investments. Well, one way to do that is to look into venture capital, to get in on the early IPOs, the companies that haven't yet made their mark, but soon will. The problem with this type of investing is it's expensive. Not everyone has tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to throw around in these type investments, these so-called alternative investments. Well, the solution might just be our crowd. Wish you were in early on some of the best performing IPOs of 2019 and 2020. With our crowd, accredited investors have access to invest directly, easily, and most importantly, early. Our crowd investors have benefited from our crowd companies IPOing like Beyond Meat or being bought by companies like Intel, Nike, Microsoft, and Oracle. Today, you can join our crowd's investment in Rewire. Rewire's digital banking services are specifically tailored for international workers to both send money home to their country of origin and bank in their country of residence. This is no small market. Rewire reports rapid year-over-year and month-over-month growth in the trillion-dollar global financial services market for international and migrant workers. You can get in early on Rewire and other unique opportunities at rcrowd.com slash EAI. If you're interested in investing, you need to join our crowd. The R Crowd account is free. Just go to O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash E-A-I. So we're talking with Danny Fatizi about the food and beverage service industry. Tell me, Danny, what did you learn about humanity as a server? Oh, my God. <laughs> Just shove the knife right in my heart. <laughs> oh, well, no, I, it's not that bad. I think what the service industry teaches you is that very few people have patience. Patience is something that we just, it's something I guess we have to work on as, as human beings. It's not like this natural, like naturally occurring thing, I guess. And especially when a DJ is pumping tracks that fast, people think faster too, (laughs) and they demand things faster. So I think it, it really depends on where you work. If you work in a place where the demographic of guests is a little bit more rough around the edges you may experience things that are really uncomfortable because in certain parts of our country, there is just, there's just demographics of people who think that there are certain things that are okay to do that really are not okay to do, or there will be comments made and people, I find it so interesting that a lot of people just like to push the envelope and see what they can get away with making certain comments or reaching out and touching people they don't know in certain ways. I'm sure we all know what I'm talking about. And then as the server, the person who is getting paid to deal with all this, you have to make a split second decision how you're going to handle it. And if you're me back then, you're going to laugh it off and take the emotional brunt of that and use it to fuel your next encounter. Did I actually make any money because I just laughed that off or was he still just a jerk anyway and didn't even tip me? That's scary to me. I think that's scary that we're, we're putting our well-being in so many ways, but especially emotionally and mentally by just saying okay to things like this at risk. And it's got long-term effects is how I feel about it. Danny, I noticed that when we were just having that conversation, you were very careful to say the me, and then you said back then. Mm. And so my question is, you are obviously a very different person today. What changed? How did you extract yourself from the service industry? Well, to start, I definitely made a decision that I just didn't want to do that anymore but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I worked backwards. 
what was it that I hated about this, these jobs? What was it that I knew in the future I didn't want to put up with? And I would start first and foremost with, I hated clocking in and out. I hated being on someone else's time. It just wasn't for me. I hated that I had to show up at a certain time and look a certain way and I couldn't express myself in certain ways. You know, I I had to have my hair down or I had to have my hair up depending on the boss or it just would, to me, was not my style of, of working that made me happy and fulfilled. And so I made some decisions about what I knew I didn't want it and then kind of eliminated all the things that would fit those roles. Right. So then I said, well, you know, I, my dad's always talked about real estate investing. He's just always talked about it. And I, and honestly, to this day, he's never done it. He's just always talked about it. (laughs) And so I was like, you know, what if, what if I looked into that and I could make those financial dreams come true for us as a family? So I went home, actually moved home to Florida where my, my parents are. And I started kind of working with my dad on how to make this happen. I was like, you know, you've always wanted to do this stuff. What do we do? How do we do this? So at this point, my dad and I sat down because I had come home to Florida and he I kind of spoke with him and I said, how do we get this started? This dream that you've had, how do we start this and get this off the ground? And he said, well, here's a Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad range of books. And we sat down together and kind of figured out how we could dig into this together. So I picked up the first one. I read through it. It made perfect sense to me. Very like basic level of like, if you want something and, and, you know, you want a TV, go out and buy something that makes you that $500 TV for life every month, right? Like that, that's the investment return, the return on the investment that you make. We, we kind of together made a plan. I I went to some educational get togethers. I started to follow certain investors that made sense to me in the realms and the industries of real estate investing that I really liked those niches. And I kind of just did whatever they were doing. I I've followed the people they were following. I listened to their podcasts. I read their books. I got on bigger pockets. I made relationships on there. I just wanted to soak up everything I could on this. And in a three or four year period, I soaked up so much information that I started ending up in situations where I was able to use that knowledge with the right people. And I think that that's definitely part of what all, all of this is I think ran by the universe. I think we're ran by the universe personally. And I think the universe shows up and delivers you in the right scenarios with the right people when you want something and you put in that work. I'm very, very firm on that. So I ended up in situations with the right people who to this day I'm still working with who have changed my life because I put that work in. It sounds like when you were in the service industry, you felt like you always had to say yes to everyone else. And after you built your confidence and started to working towards something you were interested in, all of a sudden people were starting to say yes to you. I would agree with that. So looking back, what do you think kept you in the service industry? Everyone talks about the money, but is it the money or was it your self-esteem? I really think it was the question of how do I get out? What do I even what would I even do if I wasn't here? The money definitely is the uh, umbrella over the whole problem, right? But then it's the, the trickle down is, am I educated enough? Am I, you know, old enough? Do I have enough street smarts? Well, you know, I, I have all these stories that keep me right here in this place that are just stories that I'm telling myself that are preventing me from taking a risk. And it's not like I quit my job and went out and decided I was going to be a real estate investor. If I had done that, guess what? I'd be living in a cardboard box because I wouldn't have made any money in the beginning. I would, I made nothing. I was learning while I was hustling. And I think that that's so important to point out is like, I had to complete that time, but I gave myself an end date. And I said, no more. Like I've, I've built enough other streams of income. And actually for a while, I built several other streams of income and I continued bartending while I had these other streams of income. So I was hustling all day and all night, but 
I was, I knew there was an end to this. I wasn't doing it like this is going to be my life. I did it for probably a year. I had multiple streams of income. So that way, when I finally quit bartending, I had those to fall back on. I had built them up enough that I could fall back on them and pay all my bills and be comfortable. Speaking of streams of income, tell us a little bit about your course, Breaking Free from Bartending. Yes. So I decided to take all this knowledge that I have because I've become very passionate about this and that people do feel that their stories that they tell themselves and that they tell other people are keeping them in this place, continuing to go clock in and out in a service industry job when they know deep down that they're meant for something more. They're meant for something bigger. I know that people like have this because I had it. You know, it, it crushed my soul to clock in and out. Like it crushed my soul. Cause I was like, this is not where I'm supposed to be. And so I know that I'm not the only one out there that feels that way. And I think there's very little emphasis or, or direction or education on how to take that circumstance and turn it into something where you go after something else and you can continue to use this money right now to fund all this education and, and, invest in other things that will make you educated or knowledgeable about where you want to go and where you want to be. And so I'm taking everything I've learned and I, I put it in a, in a course and it's called breaking free, how to stop going back to bartending and serving in a little parentheses at the end, as I really feel as though this isn't talked about enough. And people aren't given enough direction on this. And I, I just, I went back so many times to it myself over and over again. And I, I, I feel like the stories I told myself at the time were so legitimate, but really looking back, you know, I was just making, st- I was making excuses. So this is, this course is meant to help people who are in that place or maybe not in, they're not fed up yet, but they don't want to get to the point where they're fed up. Right. They don't want to get to that point. This is that like interim space that I'm creating for people between the life they're living now and the life that they want to be living. It's an important point because maybe people don't always realize they can take all that hard earned money they Mm -hmm. made either bartending or serving and use it to create a better life. It sounds like a job that's just hard, physically, emotionally, time consuming, one that maybe we can't do for decades and decades without, you know, having it harm us. I agree. And I think so many people stay in it for so much longer than they ever needed to, you know? And that's, I think so many people do it from like, it is the service industry after all, you know, we, we do it from a place of serving the people we love or taking care of. It's not always about us. It's about the other people or the other circumstances that we have to make sure we take care of. So you do it out of a place of necessity and a place of survival and a place of like panic almost. I think a lot of people have this like deep down fear of like, we're not taught how to handle money. Who Can anyone raise their hand out there and be like, I was taught how to handle money and deal with money from a very young age. That was one of the first things my parents taught me. No, nobody was taught that. Very few people were taught that. And I think we shape our beliefs about money as we grow and many of us saw either ourselves or our parents go through the great recession. There's so many things that have happened that have created the beliefs we have around money. And it's not fair to the money because the money is not what we think it is. You know, the beliefs that we have are not really, there's, there's quite literally, I heard this, You can fact check me because I'm not sure this is real, but Grant Cardone once said there is a billion dollars in circulation on this planet for every human being on it. Wow. That's a lot. And it's Grant Cardone and he's like a money guy. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, Grant Cardone, even if that's not true, there's tons of money out there circulating. And we seem to think that there's an end to it. We seem to have this idea in our heads that like there's a limit to it, that it's, it ends somewhere. It doesn't end somewhere. Well, Danny, it's been a pleasure talking to you about your experiences in my past dealings in this industry. Everyone I know who's been a bartender for a long enough time has one great killer story that they tell at parties. Tell us your best bartending story. Oh, my God. There's so many, right? There's (laughs) so 
Oh my God. Okay. Okay. I got it. So, okay. I, I'm just thinking like, what's the best one? So I worked in this bar. Oh my God. I worked in this bar. There's so many stories. It's like this, this particular boss ran like a house of cards. I mean, it was like going to fall apart any minute. Right. I'm like trying to figure out which of those the crazy stories to tell. It was everything from like him hiding our phones and like trying to figure out where we were at night. Crazy bartending story there to finding out that the whole place was actually bugged with microphones and he was actually listening to everything we were saying. But this particular circumstance, I had guests at my bar and we had a German cockroach problem in the, in the restaurant. And if anyone knows what German cockroaches are, you can't get rid of them. You literally have to like send in multiple different, you know, people with di- like baiting. There's all these different ways to kill German cockroaches, but it's not just like spraying it or whatever. Like it's not what you'd think it would be. It's not like your normal cockroach problem. And they're very common in bars and restaurants. We had a really, really bad cockroach problem. And I'm sitting, I'm standing behind my bar. I have a couple of like middle-aged women who are just eating a lovely steak dinner in front of me. And I'm, you know, making their martinis. And I am chatting with them, you know, I'm just chatting, chatting. And I, I, out of the corner of my eyes, I think I had trained myself to look for like little scuttling movement (laughs) on the bar. So as I'm chatting, you know, I'm telling this woman, whatever I'm telling her, I see this bug out of the corner of my eye and I'm just like, yes. Oh my gosh. And I'm literally like pulling the roach, like off the bar and I'm like, whatever, putting it on whatever was behind me. Like, absolutely, ma'am. Yes. Just Mm-hmm. Just trying to keep it low key. We found, we found bugs everywhere. I, I gotta tell you, I only could handle six months at that place and I was out. I couldn't do it anymore. God, among so many other stories, but that's probably the one that like, you know, when the house of cards is falling down and you're the, your team face, cause you're the bartender and you're trying to keep it all together so that, you know, we don't get bad reviews and I can get tipped. And you know, that's just one of the many stories. Danny, it's been a pleasure having you on. If you haven't caught her on Facebook, the page is Danny's World, and her course is Breaking Free from Bartending. Tell us what's up next in your life and how we can find you if we want to communicate with you further. Yes. So I actually own and run my own short-term rental property management company as well. So I manage vacation rentals here in Florida. So between that and the course, those are my two big babies right now that I'm kind of working on continuing to grow, continuing to, you know, fan the flames of those. But you may look on Instagram. I'm on Instagram at lifexdanny, D-A-N-I, B, because my middle name is Brittany. So it's life X Danny B. You may also look up my property management company. If you guys are ever in the mood for a, a fun tropical vacation at euphoria underscore vacations. I am on Facebook, Danny Fatizi, and you may email me. If you guys have any questions about the course or anything related to that, it is Danny D A N I Fatizi F as in Frank. A T T as in Thomas, I Z Z as in zebra, I at gmail.com. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Danny Fatizi. That's a wrap. You know what? Danny Fatizi is part of the Earn and Invest Facebook group, and so should you be. Go to facebook.com slash group slash earn and invest. Again, that's facebook.com slash group slash earn and invest. We talk about just about everything there from money to occasionally politics to sharing funny stories and gifts and memes. It's a fun place to hang out, and we really do continue the conversation that starts right here on the podcast. We'd love to see you there at the Facebook group. That's facebook.com slash group slash earn and invest. Now back to the show. This is not easy to talk about. I guess it goes back to a friend of mine. She was an obstetrician gynecologist. And when she was in residency, she was involved in a complicated case And things didn't go well, and she was peripherally involved. She helped out one of the attending physicians, really played a very minor, minor role. And a year later, the summons came, 
and she was being sued for malpractice. Now, she was a resident physician, so she was a physician in training. And as I said, she really played a very small role in the case. She was just helping someone out, really in no way bared any responsibility. But the lawsuit was a major stress on her life. In fact, it involved multiple meetings, depositions, and eventually a trial spread over years. And she told me about this while I was still in residency myself. She said, I had made a decision right there and then. If I was found guilty at trial, I would leave medicine completely. That would be it. Her reasoning was that if she was dealing with these things at the beginning of her training, when she had nothing to do with the outcome, that was not the kind of medicine that she wanted to practice. And her story was forefront in my mind as I progressed in my career. The stress increased. The workload felt almost impossible. The electronic medical records were taking up all my time. I had discovered financial independence, and I was on the cusp of making a big decision whether to leave medicine or not. When one Sunday night, a knock came on my front door, and I answered it, and I was handed legal papers. For the first time in my career, after being a doctor for some 17 years, I was being sued for malpractice. This was devastating. The case, it turns out, was one that I felt pretty sure was frivolous. After looking over the information, I had little doubt that my role was not one of malpractice. I had done what I was supposed to do. But those words from that friend of mine came back. If I am found guilty of this, I will leave medicine. And for me, I had taken it one step further. Somewhere deep down inside in my subconscious, I had drawn a line in the sand. I had decided that if I ever got sued for malpractice, regardless of the reason, that it was time for me to hang up my stethoscope and leave medicine. And I was already contemplating this. I was already looking at my life feeling the stress, and realizing that being a doctor was no longer fulfilling my unique identity, meaning, and purpose. I was no longer connected to this field. And this was almost the nail in the coffin. That was two and a half years ago. And almost two years ago, this would almost be my two-year anniversary, I indeed left clinical medicine, hung up my stethoscope, stopped seeing patients in the office, nursing home, and hospital, and pretty much left 90% of my clinical activities to only maintain a small role as a hospice medical director leading teams where I didn't actually see patients anymore. And at the time, I was worried that by leaving medicine, I would lose a part of my identity. I would lose my purpose. I would lose my standing in society and with family and friends. I would lose everything. Well, this is Thanksgiving 2020, and I've been thinking a lot about what I feel thankful for. And hands down, one of the biggest things I feel thankful for this year, two years after I left my clinical job, is I'm thankful that I received that summons that day. And the reason why is it was the final lever that pushed me away from medicine, this world that was no longer bringing me any happiness And it forced me to confront what I really wanted out of life. Since I left medicine, my stress levels have gone down significantly. Since I've left medicine, I have been more present for my wife and kids than ever. 
since I've left medicine, I've had some of the most creative years of my life, and I've built the Earn and Invest podcast. I've continued to write and public speak. These have been good years. In fact, these have been some of the best. Now, I wouldn't lie and say that they have been worry-free. I wouldn't say that I've totally been cleared of all stress in my life. Nothing could be further than the truth. I still have stress. I stress about my rental properties. I stress about making the podcast. I stress about all those other things that people stress about. It's just it's much easier and I recover much faster. This is not nirvana, but it certainly is a much better, more purposeful life than I was leading. About six months ago, I got an email from my lawyer. It turns out that this malpractice suit was dropped. There are various reasons for this, and believe it or not, it doesn't mean it's gone away completely. In fact, it can be refiled. That's always a possibility. But it's gone for the moment. And I think about how strange life is. My biggest fear, the thing I dreaded the most, being sued for malpractice, the one thing that I knew for sure would make me want to leave medicine happened. And it had the intended consequence. And I've never been better. This has been a strange year 2020. Things have not happened the way we thought they would. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for all the things that are going right. I'm thankful for hope for the next year. I'm thankful that my life and my family's life is in order. And I'm thankful for all of you who take your time to listen to this podcast, to send me your feedback, and to be part of this community, which has become such a big part of my life. Thank you for going along with this ride with me, and happy Thanksgiving. I hope you and yours enjoy it, and take care of yourselves. So what'd you think? Oh, that was so fun. Thank you. Sorry for the background noise. Oh, no, no, no. Don't it's worry about it. I will, crazy. I will crazy. edit it and 99% of people won't even notice it's there. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. I'm Did a you feel like that. you got to tell your story? Like I wanted to really delve deeply into what this is and why. And you do such a good job of talking about it in really clear, understandable Thank ways. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how I got this articulate, but you're not the first person to say that, so I appreciate that. I don't know where it came from. I think my mom my mom is very articulate. So I do I do feel like I got to tell my story. That's that's really important. And it it fed very nicely, thank you, into talking about the course. That's um, my plan. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was perfect. I think it it definitely we, we went through the ups and downs, like, cause the ups are the ups and the downs are the downs. I mean, there are pros, but then there are, you know, so many cons. And so I think I felt like I got to hit all the important points. We talk a lot in personal finance about income and people make such a big deal about income. And one of the things uh, that's great about your story is you clearly found a way to high income, right? 10,000 a month ain't bad, you know, for, not requiring four years of college or some exactly. kind of special training. On the other hand, you also clearly found that it wasn't worth it. Like it wasn't bringing out good things in you. It wasn't fulfilling your needs. Mm -mm. It, it was giving you less of a life, not more of one. And that's uh, that's an interesting story. And that's kind of why I reached out to you because I think well, that's, thank you. that's something people don't hear as much, uh, but yeah. plays into it. 